So um, let's first start with the policy intervention block. In this block, we have two presenters. The first presenter is Professor Ning Tai, uh, who is an assistant professor in the Department of Urban Planning and Policy in the University of Illinois at Chicago in the US. She has joint appointments at the Institute for Environmental Science and Policy, um, and her research and the teaching interests center on integrating life cycle perspectives and the locally specific data um, into environmental planning and the uh, sustainable policy making. Welcome, Professor. Thank you. Good afternoon, everybody. Thank you, Paul, for the invitation, and thank you for everybody who has who have worked together and helped gather the group who share a sincere interest in urban metabolism and material waste management studies. By accepting the invitation from Paul, I didn't agree to talk about the best practice of waste management in the U.S. because the U.S. didn't have the best practice from a global perspective. <laughs> I will stop here because I know it's recording, so I'm not going to do too much here. <laughs> I will say my goal is to share with you my perspectives of material waste management issues, lessons learned, experiences um, from both that ugly part of it, or being my target part of it, and then try to brainstorm some ideas. Hopefully, that will help us spearhead the afternoon session right after lunch. All right, let's get started. So, the presentation today includes or seemingly separate, different, but actually interconnected issues. The first one is about the current practice of standalone processes of managing environmental and social economic issues for a long time. Yeah, you think about environmental uh, system planning, you typically manage it from air, land, water, and that's typically a separate from social economic impact analysis. Well, the second issue is the challenges of financial viability and sustainability. I always tend to share this very important point at the very beginning of my presentation because when we talk about three pillars of sustainability, we have to admit, we have to acknowledge the reality, no matter how many aspirations we have, environmentally sustainable policies have to be financially viable and sustainable first. So what it means for us is a serious and a critical challenge. The third one is about the dilemma of social equity and economic efficiency. We do not hear a lot about discussions on equity issues. I will just give you some examples today. Um, hopefully, it will help you start thinking about it, how it could possibly incorporate in the policy intervention process. Lastly, inspired by the session, Paul has arranged after this, talk about the role of data. I will also talk about my own research focusing on material flow analysis and how uh, uh, the uh, material waste management data could support locally specific efficient strategies. All right, let's get started. The first one is about integrating material waste management approaches. So for people in this room, the flow of material uh, uh, management will now be new to you. But I want to highlight two issues here. First one is the fabrication of contamination. What do we mean by diversion? So in the US, diversion means diversion from landfills or incinerators. That means the materials that either recycled, manufactured, recovered, composted, then they will fall in the category of waste diversion. The second one, more importantly, is about the dynamic relationship as I marked at the very bottom here. Waste generation is the sum of waste disposal and waste diversion. So a lot of times when you see policy making process focus on the recycling rate, or generation rate, rarely has a policy agenda integrate them into this together. So intuitively, for a region who generate less than another region, but rarely do any recycling, essentially still all materials end up in landfills. It's not in our example, right? But for regions who tend to generate a lot, given the high density of population, buildings, but they also recycle a lot, that means they need more of diversion, high diversion rate. Essentially, the waste that is get disposed of actually will get less. So this dynamic relationship is not that clearly studied, and I don't think we actually, you nowadays, have enough data information to 
so clearly demonstrate how to manage this all together. But one thing is clear, an example of economic implications again. Think about the collection process. For the waste we generated all together, right? We talk about the sorting process. So no matter how much we recycle, right? The waste stream, the, gen the, the tonnage of it, assuming it's a given number, if more materials go through the diversion process, less will be in the garbage truck. What it means is the unit cost for garbage collection will increase, actually. That actually would mean a lot of municipalities who care about the cost implications for them. So we'll talk about that. But I want to bring it up as an important issue for us to think through the process of material waste management. So in the US, the federal government regulates the states are responsible for developing and updating solid waste plants every five years. However, it was never strictly enforced. No one really actually did any penalties if the waste management plants were not updated every five years. And the state may delegate the responsibility to localities to have the plant made. So if a locality, a county, or city has a plan in place, most of the time it is focusing on waste generation or they call remaining capacity. What it means is they are assuming the waste generation volume will increase along with the population growth. It will be in proportion. And then the, the locality will need to make sure the remaining capacity of landfills will be enough to accommodate projected growth of waste. What is missing is a system view of that. Again, if you think about metabolic processes or life cycle processes, or the mix of material waste management structure needed. So some countries and states are actually ahead of others. I'm um, providing here as an example. Um, besides mitigating the impacts of new facilities, they actually emphasize the top two. First one is to minimize the impacts of existing facilities. Second is to avoid unnecessary expansion. Those are very important because in the US, very often, you see the regulations will only focus on the permitting process. Once it is approved, no one really closely monitor that. So having focus on considerations of existing facilities in the long term is a big step forward. The second one is to avoid unnecessary expansion. In the US context, again, this is very important because of the increasing public opposition to setting new facilities because not in the backyard, that locally unwanted land uses, then we see an increasing trend of expansions instead of building new landfills. Uh, intuitively, you understand, instead of finding a new location or a new site, they basically just have the current landfills bigger, larger. So if you check into statistics in the US, the number of landfills actually have dropped over time. But if you look closer in terms of capacity of the landfills, actually the total volume getting bigger. So. This is a very uh, important issue to catch. And also, uh, planners have uh, started considering material waste management new development. In the past, typically this is out of sight, out of mind issues. As long as developers could identify where the waste will go, off site, get managed on a daily basis, good. Then planners, proactive ones, have considered uh, including uh, sustainable material waste management issues in new development. Even more, um, proactively will be the integrated plants and the goals. For example, that is here are some of the examples not only in the US but in North America. New York City, Chicago, uh, Denver in Colorado, and Vancouver uh, in, in Canada. So you will see an interesting trend when the environmental goals are set related to material waste management is no longer in a standalone environmental plan. It's more like an integrated plan. And every aspect and the goals actually work out together towards sustainability. So when you check out the title, it may not be a waste management plan, a waste management goal. Rather, it is more like an all-in-one document. The one I like best is this case in the Metro Vancouver in Canada. So here is an example that I see the true integration of material waste management goals into other sustainability goals. For example, they have included drinking water management plan in the morning. Someone will talk about disaster management, uh, homeless, 
uh, management of plants, emergency management of plants, water, air, and also supplies, and um, some other hazardous waste. So, and the parks and the uh, green waste, for example. So, here, when the waste management plan is updated, part of it is required that the, uh, the planners work together with other policymakers and other divisions, units, so to make sure the waste management uh, is clearly defined and uh, sustainably managed in the goals uh, setting process. So, I was really encouraged when American Planning Association approached me in 2015. That was the first time that American Planning Association realized planners and the social scientists have a role to play in material waste management. And they asked me to uh, uh, produce this publication uh, called Planning for Sustainable Material and Waste Management. So I brought a few copies today here. If you're interested, feel free to grab one uh, on the way out. Um, initially, the original uh, print is much smaller. However, for sustainability reasons, American Planning Association stopped mass printing. So it's distributed online, but I uh, print out a few copies, not for everybody. Uh, so uh, bring it uh, if you are really interested and share with it. So basically, in this report, um, I covered six aspects of it related to uh, material waste management, including the environment, not a surprise, infrastructure, finance, economy, equity, and technology. Uh, my uh, author uh, contributed to the, uh, the economy session. So, for example, uh, in the environmental category, and I talk about locally specific uh, MWM methods. We all know the with hierarchy as suggested by U EPA. So here was a uh, motivation by practitioners who argued that we should not always be against landfill disposal because for some reasons, uh, especially in the near term, it is feasible, it is cost effective, and that's the way to uh, uh, maintain the sanitary goals. And for some reasons, and they have their own uh, unique challenges and maybe a unique endowment uh, advantages. So it's more preferable to start uh, recycling practice and more likely to achieve economy of scale. So I started talking about compliance regulatory issues and then um, highlight those locally specific challenges and the plans across the market media, air, water, and noise, for example and connections with other sustainability plans, as I have just uh, shown uh, on the previous slide. The second aspect is about infrastructure, where I talk about the need of considering uh, planning for different types of infrastructure instead of just focusing on landfill per se. Also, in our planning process, planners in this room will know we typically will project into uh, 20 years and then figure out how, how many people we may expect in the region and then estimate how much more waste may be associated with this uh, part of population increase. I uh, uh, use this uh, opportunity to argue we need to decouple uh, waste the volume from economic population growth and how we uh, could get there. And then here in the report, I should also acknowledge I have got a page limit, so I could not expand further, but there was a, another important aspect which I will not be able to leverage on today is a health impact related to material waste management, which is still uh, a limitation of this report. The third aspect is about finance. Here, um, I highlight the realistic uh, in the world market, right? Um, and how to budget wisely and, uh, uh, and uh, try to balance environmental and economic goals. For economy goals, uh, this is more like a macro level uh, issue. So uh, my author, Dr. Nancy Greenlee, discuss the job creation opportunities and uh, how to promote industry development using both carriers and states uh, to uh, encourage and uh, discourage, uh, encourage environmental sustainability behaviors to jobs and discourage those um, uh, polluting activities. Um, and then um, think about the ways of divergent impact on regional aspects. I have a separate section in this uh, publication related to equity which uh, I'll touch on a little bit today. Um, mostly bring up the uh, different aspects of it, the controversy surrounding waste facility setting and how planners and policymakers and different stakeholders could work together to address that. And lastly, not this, is about technology. So we talk about different ways and we call it the big data era, 
but I tend to say in terms of machine waste management, we are not that lucky to have that big data. Big, da big data might, if we could use the word in waste management area, would be the heterogeneities cross regions, inconsistencies cross regions. That would be the big inconsistencies and heterogeneities. All right, let me get into some specific issues, starting with economic considerations, how to balance environmental economic goals. So a few years back, I did this life cycle cost analysis of material waste management. So it covers the, the life cycle of landfill from prior construction to construction, operating, maintenance, global and post -global. If you check into limited literature, right, where you only see the cost data of those blue two, uh, two blue chart about construction and operating, those are more immediately tangible impacts, as I uh, put it here. So um, I include this three step analysis. The first one with the short term and the bottom direct impacts with production, transportation, processing. So it's mostly related to the short term immediate impacts. But also, I expand my study to cover the entire life cycle of uh, uh, waste management. So I include different scenarios, including landfills, new landfills, landfill expansion, recycling, and uh, mix, like half recycling and half landfill, like that. So my, uh, my study uh, uh, covered not only the short term direct impacts, but also the long term direct impacts, like facility maintenance, post care, care, monitoring, impact assessment. By the way, those all um, are required by US EPA. And then also include indirect impacts, accident, isolated costs, and amount of fire effects. So my findings include those preventing activities incur the lowest short term cost that nicely explain why that feels remain to be preferable over the past uh, decade, given all the technology advanced in the US, and still you not know, uh, as used the primary method. But we see over time, we do see a cost jump uh, because of the recurring cost of post the short-term cost considerations will discourage recycling. So during economic recession, the cost concerns will become more uh, pressing. So I did a study um, about waste management approaches um, during economic recession and where I create the budget cuts. Um, through literature review and the interviews uh, of, uh, of nearly 1,000 uh, literature, and these are some of the general categories of approaches I have identified. Apparently, if the municipalities want to get more revenue, they will increase fees. Unfortunately, these increased fees will increase fees for recycling. So, for example, some spending now to have charged for that, they start to do that. And then reduce services could include coverage, could include frequency, could include types of materials. Privatized services improve efficiency or control material flow. Interestingly, you may notice this is actually not allowed in the US by a uh, Supreme Court. But some of the regions would intentionally hold on to the waste, meaning do not ship it outside, keep it all within our boundary, so that our landfills will achieve on your scale, will get the money, and then uh, we will not need to pay for others. Um, essentially, um, what we found is reduced the municipal and the uh, a material waste management budget actually may not necessarily compromise environmental performance. So to expand a little bit, um, I'm showing here a summary table of market-based instruments. The first column shows the instruments that will uh, generate revenue or expected to generate revenue. Second one, meaning we incur cost to municipalities. The third one will be non-revenue instruments, more like you know, public service or revenue in the future. So more details in the reports. I will highlight the first column, revenue generating instruments uh, for a uh, few of them. Um, I would like also to highlight, this is not only charge money. Actually, this includes the transfer. For example, the last one, tax um, on disposal options, and then use those extra fees to subsidize recycling. So in terms of net, actually, it may not be a uh, uh, more for society, but you'll be able to implement polluter pace principles and have those activities like recycling that generate positive activities to be a uh, 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 viable. All right, so <coughs> these are not new actually, and uh, as the professor explained earlier on, in the US we also have recycling reward programs to the right, but it's not for individual type of materials, it is for all types of materials altogether. So basically, what the 
means if households recycle more, they will get two pounds to go to retail stores. How is this implemented? For example, uh, the recycling truck will go to the household and then the truck uh, would pick up the recycling bin that has an RFID tag uh, attached to it. And then the truck worker will scan the tag and then the uh, truck also has a scale uh, associated to it. So that information will be transferred to the company who track information and then every month uh, it will uh, provide the consumer the funds. Hey, as the show programs have been there for decades, it's not uh, new. Basically, the more waste people generate in by bag or by bottle, then the more they pay. In the case of Portland, they did check the impact and they see um, the decrease in the garbage generation and more uh, recycling behavior. I would like to point to the chart to the bottom. And actually, during recession, um, they reduced the garbage collection from weekly to bi weekly. And then they uh, included uh, uh, the scrap and yard degree uh, beans, and then increased the weekly uh, collection and uh, added the different types of uh, recycling beans. Another one, uh, which I would strongly advocate from an innovation perspective, and uh, one of the few cases in the US that has been implemented at the city level is uh, the West Philadelphia model, so called uh, surplus food recovery uh, uh, framework. Basically, what they did is to connect grocery stores with the food producer, uh, food processors. So, uh, by the end of the day, you'll get the information of surplus food from grocery stores, and they'll program it based on surplus food. They'll program it into the menu, meaning cook those food based on the mix and the composition of them, and then sell the Cooked food, which is a value added approach, and this is supported by US and UK. Well, quickly, I'll go through the uh, equity issues. Now, many of you may have realized every state in the US is both an importer and exporter of waste. Basically, it could go even from the west coast to the east coast, and apparently across the, the country uh, border as well. I would also like to include some of the interesting quotes that uh, um, you may find very self provoking. For example, former mayor uh, of New York City said the city's waste was a fair change for the city's cultural and economic contribution to national life. The former official of the United EPA said landfills and communities can work together and accept each other and actually benefit from each other. Some officials could even make it bold, like garbage is good, which is quite in contrary to what we perceive from a waste disposal landfill perspective. What they mean good is a claim the benefits of waste import. For example, for communities who host landfills, they could get compensation, so-called post community fees, which is quite actually uh, minimal, like a dollar per ton. But for those economically distressed communities, this means a lot, considering the gigantic volume of the waste they accept. But you can also imagine what it means. Essentially, it's a hot spot, meaning those communities eventually become the clusters of those undesirable facilities. So planning has a tool, so-called zoning. It separates residential uses from industrial commercial uses, basically to protect the uh, social welfare. And some of the uh, evolving zoning ordinances have already considered those and uh, intended consequences to try to protect those communities and educate them, try now to have them uh, carry an uh, unfair portion of the uh, pollution impact. This is the interesting case, uh, to my surprise, that comes in Houston. Uh, when I went on a toxic tour. So you see here is a refinery in the Manchester uh, community. It's actually, the refinery is about 20 feet away from the residences. Why that's the case? So in zoning or in planning, we say, okay, you as refinery or power plants or those uh, polluting facility owners, you cannot build a polluting facility next to residence or um, sensitive population. But the zoning and planning permit didn't say schools and residents cannot build next to the polluting facilities. <laughs> so the so refinery owner was successful in lobbying the residences, telling you, you want a school, right? You want new buildings, new houses, right? You want new community centers, right? All right, if you agree to have us locate new community, we promise you all this. And this is how it happens. You see the 
playground next to the plant. Just literally next to it. And you see the house right next door. Uh, 20 feet is about 7 meters. Uh, all that. So you get the idea what it means. Lastly, as a transition to the next session, um, as I mentioned, cognitively, um, I got to a material flow uh, analysis as well. And here we see the need of community specific data because clearly the composition will be different. And the planning tools could facilitate data collection given the current data constraints. Well, there are a lot of web based tools and we are uh, emerging with technology supported the tracking systems. But I also want to advocate for some of the missed opportunities. For example, city ordinance could incorporate recycling and data reporting as a required element. Market derived data, for example, pay as you programs could be used to track down individual households' behaviors. And we could involve stakeholders, or not, we have a lot of social media um, uses among uh, residents, among businesses. We could count on them to do that. But for communities, they actually still do not have the capacity to get the accurate data. Unlike water or electricity, you got the meters that install the building level. You could see that. How do we uh, facilitate the collection process? So we develop a generic model uh, uh, in, in uh, uh, food waste. Actually, I should start saying here, I'm showing two very different, uh, distinct cases. One is food waste, the other is the batteries. So in terms of food waste, we uh, divide this generic model, basically separating the buildings in different types, residences, commercial areas, institutions, and yeah, the restaurants, and then um, checking the parameter rate and then figure out how they are distributed in the 77 communities uh, in the Chicago area. And based on the estimated food waste generation, we estimate the potential of donation, meaning those uh, edible food and could be recovered and reused if we plan it. And uh, you see here, the green dots shows the density of, uh, of food waste food surplus donation uh, potential, and the kind of yellow dots, the wrong ones, show the location of food banks. And we spatially match this together. What you see to the right is the index we developed. If it is red, uh, you see branch here on the screen, it means those communities are in need of surplus food. If it shows as blue, that means they have a lot more, but currently it's not collected. And we allocate for planning intervention and coordination to connect those neighborhoods by better and more efficient logistics of planning. Essentially, the goal of this type of research is to argue that we should recognize opportunities in urban areas, not the challenges like how much waste generates and the volume that uh, is really opportunities, that, that diverse opportunities we could take advantage of, and also the common skill that are likely to achieve. So we could transform the, the challenges to opportunities. The second case study, as I promised, is called the batteries, similar for e-waste. You know, it has these uh, characteristics. But one thing I think particularly important from a planning perspective, from a long-term perspective, is the specific infrastructure needs. For example, individuals may not easily assemble that at home. They need special uh, facilities to do that, and they do need a long -term time to get there. And uh, good news is they do not need to assemble it all the time. The paper is even at the end of their lifetime, it could be repurposed for energy storage. So we uh, uh, try to refine the model by considering the technology considerations in a uh, dynamic lifespan uh, scenario. And we also model different discard patterns. And we try to uh, uh, provide more accurate um, uh, estimates at the US level. We also uh, estimate at state and county levels. The case study at state level was in California where you see a uh, uh, majority of new EVs have been adopted and progressive adoption of renewable energy, which we consider as an important opportunity to reduce them locally. So those show the, the results. And, um, and this map shows the match of uh, the uh, uh, energy storage demand and uh, uh, cumulative EPM battery units. Um, unlike the, the food waste scenario, note here, food waste has relatively small value in economic terms, but they are scattered in a large amount of locations. For EV batteries, individually, they have a pretty significant residual value, but they are not as many 
or as that scattered in the region. So this presents very different logistics and transport challenges, apparently different for uh, infrastructure planning and the cost analysis as well. All right, um, very quickly I want to sum up as uh, some key takeaway points. First one, sustainable policies need to be economically viable and sustainable first. Redistribution of costs and benefits across regions, across sectors, uh, across time, necessitates a careful, more careful examination. Implementing local solutions would necessitate proactive facility planning at the region wide quality and efforts. And top down and bottom up approaches are both needed. Education and innovation are uh, critical. Before I wrap up, I want to show you one image. So this is a taken in a restaurant in Canada. If you look closely, it said recycle paper, recycle plastics, and compost organics. So a lot of visitors to this restaurant will ask, where is the garbage can? And that's exactly the question the owner wanted to get. And if you will educate every client customer in the restaurant, we want to achieve zero waste economy. All right. So I'll stop here. Thank you for your attention uh, and uh, welcome your questions after.